Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm John Updike, president of Open Primaries. Uh, thank you for joining us on this virtual Zoom forum slash discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to um, invite all of you to participate in this conversation with two really distinguished activists and scholars, uh, Tom Riley, who is the chancellor of the Nevada System of Higher Education, and Jacqueline Salet, who is the president of uh, independentvoting.org and the author of Independence Rising. Uh, the two of them have collaborated on a new chapter uh, entitled, Can Independent Voters Save American Democracy? Uh, why 42% of American voters are independent and how they can transform our political system. This chapter appears in a, in a new book, Democracy Unchained, How to Rebuild Government for the People. And I'm very eager to talk with them about their chapter and what they're seeing in American politics right now. So let's dive right into it. Um, before Jackie and Tom, before we talk about your chapter, can you say a little bit about the book itself, Democracy Unchained. How did that book come about? How were you invited to submit a chapter as part of it? What's the, what kind of, what's the process of this book coming together? Uh, John, uh, thanks so much for having us. Uh, and uh, it's great to be here with uh, everyone who's a part of the call here. I mean, briefly, uh, this is kind of like a rolling project. Um, in the summer of 2017, uh, a consortium had come together uh, that consisted of the Morrison Institute at Arizona State University, which Tom was the executive director of at the time, the Schwarzenegger Institute at USC, and independent voting. And we collaborated together to uh, publish a report, uh, which came out in October of 2017 called Game Changers, which was really kind of the beginning of, of a joint collaboration on exploring Who's the independent voter? Why are people independents? What role are they playing in American politics? Um, and, uh, and, and what's their future, you know, as a, as a community of voters? And right around the time that our paper was published, that our, our uh, report was published, Game Changers, uh, a national conference took place uh, in Ohio at Oberlin called the State of American Democracy, and about okay. 200 researchers and active, activists uh, from around the country came together to have a conversation about this topic. Uh, the Schwarzenegger Institute was a sponsor of the conference, and it was hosted by David Orr, the very distinguished uh, environmentalist and uh, professor and author and so forth. And I was fortunate to be at the conference. Uh, but one of the projects that came out of that gathering was a decision to do a book that would bring together multiple voices from multiple viewpoints on a whole set of questions that are facing uh, American democracy. And uh, so the Schwarzenegger folks were very, very interested to have a chapter on independent voters be a part of the book. And so they spoke to me and then I called Tom and I asked Tom if he would co-author it with me and he was like, great, let's definitely do it. Uh, and so, you know, we, uh, we uh, were in touch with the editors and, and uh, became a part of the process with like 30 other authors from around the country. And by then, Tom had moved to Nevada to uh, take on his position as chancellor. So we did, uh, we did a number of meetings on the book in Las Vegas, which was great because Tom is great to work with. And also, I did really well at the blackjack tables. So it was kind go. of win-win. It was win-win for me. <laughs> all around. Uh, but anyway, it was, it was a wonderful experience and, and we're just very, very glad to be a part of that incredible roster of, of writers uh, and activists who, uh, who, who are part of the book. Wow, that's, that sounds very interesting. Um, I, I love this chapter. It's very significant and there's a number of things I wanted to ask you about before we open it up. So one of the things I was struck by is that you talk, I mean, the title of the chapter is Can Independent Voters Save American Democracy? And you talk about independence in almost therapeutic terms, that independent voters have the capacity or the potential to heal 
the country, to heal some of the wounds caused by the partisanship that is so dominant in today's um, political conversation. So how did you get there? How did you get to that kind of healing understanding of who independents are and the role that they could play in the country? Jack, you want to start and then I'll add to it? Sure. Um, I think there were kind of a number of maybe of pathways uh, that, that brought us there. Some of it was some very, very fine and novel uh, research that uh, some of which was done actually under Tom's direction at, at ASU on uh, things like, you know, what new sources do uh, Democrats look at? What new sources do Republicans look at? What new sources do independents look at? And it turns out as you expect, independents have a much broader range of material that they go to through which to form their opinions. And uh, in, in that research, which Tom can talk more about, about, you started to see this role that independent voters were playing like with their, in their families and in their communities and in their social networks of being a bridge between people whose views were, I would say a little bit more calcified or more um, ideologically uh, determined and so forth. And so we saw that kind of going on at, at, um, at just a personal level and a human level. Uh, but at a broader level, and here I say this now as a longtime organizer, um, independents really feel very strongly that the political system uh, categorizes people and keeps people apart by virtue of invoking a set of political identities, members of a party, what's your ideology, what, you know, where do you fit in, where do you fit in, where do you fit in? And a big part of why so many people have chosen to become independents, and now it's 45% of the country based on you know, the latest uh, Gallup polling, um, one of the reasons that people do that is that they don't want to be forced into those categories and they want to be able to think independently, they want to be able to act independently, and they want to be able to create bridges with people who are different than themselves, but who have the capacity to engage on a whole set of issues. Yeah, just following up what, what Jackie has said that I know just from a, uh, my own personal professional career, I was formerly a county executive in Las Vegas Valley, Clark County, I, uh, which I <clears throat> work with a, a partisan board, a partisan elected board, uh, as, you know, right now I work for an elected uh, board of regents. And, you know, in, in many of those roles, in fact, uh, in, in the most recent role, one of the reasons the regents felt so comfortable with me was because I identified as an independent. It's a very hyper-partisan world we live in. Uh, those that are independent, that don't have these pre-described views uh, that individuals right. associate with a Republican or Democrat. So it's independent that can communicate uh, across uh, political parties um, is rare these days. Uh, and it's something that many individuals are desperately looking for. But going back to the research uh, uh, at ASU, uh, one of the projects we looked at is we build upon the Pew study of where individuals get their information. And once they get that information, their news information, uh, who do they share that with? Um, and um, we can expound that, uh, expand at that. In, in, instead of just looking at Republicans and Democrats, we added independents, uh, where independents are a large part of the uh, political um, sphere in Arizona. We looked equally at Republicans, Democrats, and independents, and we asked uh, where they get their news source and. Um, the news sources, we asked them, uh, we didn't do a content analysis, but we asked them how they viewed their, um, the various different news sources from very conservative to very liberal. Uh, and then we asked them, once you, once you receive that news, who do you talk to about? Uh, and, and what we found, like the Pew study, is that you know, we live in bubbles. We, we tend to choose our news sources that reinforce our worldview. Uh, kind of cafeteria style. And so we tend to go to those that, that, that reinforce our worldview. And then once we have that, we tend to talk to those that reinforce our worldview. So we end up living in all these bubbles. Well, what we found really, you know, kind of confirmed what Pew looked at in the national, that 
the more conservative you are, you tend to, to rally around one news source like Fox News. Um, but Democrats equally, the more liberal they identify themselves, identify with more liberal sources of news. Uh, and they tend to only talk to Republicans and Democrats. Um, but when we found that those individuals that actually had independence as part of their, their network of sharing information, it moderated their news sources, which is very interesting. So it introduced other viewpoints into conversations when either Republicans or Democrats actually had independence as part of their news source. So what, what we had talked about is that could independence serve as more of a moderating uh, uh, um, uh, way of, uh, of analyzing news, looking at different viewpoints, and perhaps considering different viewpoints. That's interesting. So it's already happening in some ways. It's not just a, a possibility in the future. It's something that it's a role independents are already playing in their social networks, in their community networks. That's very interesting. I think many of us felt that, obviously, from a personal standpoint, but to validate that through some research that right. this hyper partisan world that looking at individuals that perhaps aren't pre-described to one viewpoint or another, uh, people may feel more comfortable sharing. And that, that research is, is available. I mean, it was published at ASU and USC a number of years ago, right? It's called- it's it, it is, I mean, that, that information is actually, if you go to the Arizona State University Morrison Institute, it's on their website. So you have, uh, 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 that report is done. There's also two uh, academic journals that are under peer review right now that kind of expound upon those ideas. Of right, America. great. So here's, a, here's another question for you. So the, the issue of tribalism, of partisanship, of, of um, you know, people only being in their bubbles is something that is widely discussed and, there's, and debated. And from reading your chapter, part of it, it seems to me that you're arguing, given that 42, 45% of the country is nonpartisan, that we need to restructure the American political system to take into account that so many people are independent and that that's going to play a positive role in addressing the tribalism and the, and the partisanship. There are other people in the political reform movement who come to the exact opposite conclusion. What they say in response to the tribalism is that you have to strengthen the political parties. The parties need to be given more authority, more control over the, the structure and aspect of, of American politics. And just wanted to see what you thought about that. I, I have my opinion, I'm sure everyone else does too, but what are your, what's your thought about that, that debate? Chuck, you wanna start? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, my first, my first response to it actually is that I, with all due respect to Mr. Drutman, who I don't know, but I know he's highly respected, uh, writer and academic and whatnot. Um, I would like to see him present that argument in a room full of independents. <laughs> uh -huh. I just don't see that. It seems so um, explicitly counter to this evolution and this development and this, if you want to call it disalignment, you know, it, to me, it goes really right to the heart of the question of why people are becoming independents. Um, they're making a statement, I, I sometimes refer to it as a statement of non-compliance with the parties and with that, with the system that privileges the parties, you know, in the ways that it does. And, you know, there is, as you know, John, there's a very big debate on the whole question of whether independents actually exist or not. Right. And this is something, you know, Tom and I dealt with this in the chapter. Um, we even got a call from uh, one of our editors close to publication time because somebody had come out with a new poll that showed that there were only 7% of the country was actually independent. <laughs> and, you know, and, and did we want to change the title of the, <laughs> of the chapter? But, you know, the answer was no, because it is the case that, you know, when people identify themselves as independents, we take that to have great meaning and um, and meaning beyond, for example, what the pundits or the consultants and media will often say, which is, well, you could call yourself an independent, but if you voted for a Democrat or Republican in the last two elections, that means you're really a leaner, da, 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 da. And I don't really 
I don't, I don't accept that argument. People vote for who they vote for. It's often the case that the only choices that they have are Democrats or Republicans. But I think the notion that in an environment where more and more people in different kinds of ways are seeking out a kind of political mobility, the idea that how you would respond to that is to strengthen a kind of authoritarian structure which requires loyalty, discipline, ideological purity, et cetera, et cetera, above all else, seems like a very ill-advised uh, response to, to something that's going on that I think has very profound meaning to, to tens of millions of Americans. Hmm. You know, I, I, just to expand upon that, you know, it's, you know, this, this notion that there can't be independent-minded individuals who have a mind of their own and can make choices after they do research of candidates or, or political positions or don't prescribe to a set agenda by either party is, is, is strange that that's um, something that is, is not embraced by more individuals. Um, you know, Morrison Institute also kind of spent time talking to a host of independents to get a sense of like, who are you? <laughs> because we're all over the political spectrum, from very conservative and, and libertarian to, 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 to very liberal. Um, in, in the work Morrison did, did find that, you know, a larger part perhaps were a bit more um, uh, progressive on social issues, a little more conservative on um, financial issues. But there are some, you know, thematic issues that came out there. And, and, and one of those thematic issues was that they didn't want to be part of a party. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that, that, that they, and they wanted to do and, and make their own decisions about who candidates are. And I think that's um, a really an important concept. And I think as Jackie hit it is that, you know, from an academic standpoint, you know, the, you know that they're independents, that they tend to be leaners, or they're really Republicans and Democrats in disguise. When when all you have is a choice on your ballot is a Republican or Democrat, um, you know that you, you don't really have choices. Yeah. In fact, the whole framework is always phrased. If you look at pollsters, if you look at discussions in the media, is that we have defined our political system because of the way it's structured only between Republicans and Democrats. Not the notion. If you listen to most pollsters about um, the election, of you know. Well, we know the majority of Republicans support Trump, and we know the more majority of Democrats do not. To me, the bigger question is where do independents stand? Because if you look at historically where they have shifted um, as change agents or as concerns about corruption or a uh, host, of, those to me are the are the group of individuals you want to study more and talk to, not assume that they're Republicans or Democrats. Got it. All right, we have a million questions flooding in uh, related completely to what we're talking about. So I want, I want to throw it to um, Marcus Wedner in Florida. Go ahead, Marcus, you're on. Sorry, it took me a second to, uh, to unmute there. No worries. Yeah, my, my question touches exactly what you guys are talking about, which is, you know, when you get into the context historically of, of actual voting, Right, so not just what people say and whether or not they like parties or want to be a part of a party, but get down to the actual voting. David Pluff on his podcast, I think it was last week, said, well, we all know that independents tend to vote Republican, and it was in the context of swing states and how do you target and who do you target if you're the Biden campaign. Um, and, uh, and so, so there's sort of like how research showing how independents feel about the system, and all, but when you get right down to the the actual statistics, you know, is it really the case that independents really kind of break sort of evenly between Democrat, you know, and Republican, assuming those are the only two choices on the ballot? Yeah. I mean, I can, I can speak to that somewhat. Uh, wow. Uh, gee, uh, first, let me just say <laughs> Democratic strategists are writing off independent voters. <laughs> That's really not a good thing from from their vantage point. Um, independents were tending to split down the middle in presidential elections through 2004, but then that started to change in 2008. Independents, um, first independents gave the Democratic nomination to Obama uh, in 2008, 
uh, over Hillary Clinton, and then uh, they broke for Obama in uh, the general election over John McCain. They swung uh, to uh, the Republicans after that, uh, both in the midterms and then uh, in the next presidential. Uh, I will tell you, you know, that um, I personally was involved in a whole set of dialogues and discussions and strategy meetings with the Obama team for the re-election campaign when the whole question of whether and what they needed to do to rebuild their coalition with independent voters was on the table. And frankly, the Democrats, um, the DNC kind of poo-pooed that and said, oh, we don't need to do that. You know, we can win the election uh, without those independents. And they were right that they could win it without independents. They lost them to Romney. But I think they also opened the floodgates to what happened in 2016 when independents broke the Trump. Uh, though in the midterm elections, independents swung in the opposite direction and gave Democrats control of Congress. So I think this really kind of speaks to Tom's point, independents, they're not ideologues. I mean, there's, there's somewhere between nine and 12 million Americans who voted for Obama and then voted for Trump. And that tells you something, I think, about that the independent mindset is not an ideological mindset. It's a, it's a community of voters who are looking to right the system. They're, they believe that there is that there are fundamental, structural, and even moral problems <laughs> with the system, the way that it operates. And they're looking to fight that. They're looking to, um, to support candidates and issues and so forth that can push the envelope on it. Now, does that look like it's kind of an erratic swing from an ideological point of view? Well, if you're judging it ideologically, yes. But if you're looking at it in new ways as the push-pull of what it takes to actually drive the system forward and force some changes, it's very, very coherent. And, and that really is, I think, at the, at the heart of what it means to be an independent in America today. Um, let me throw it to Sue Davies. Sue Davies had uh, from New Jersey uh, has a, a kind of a question comment about that dynamic of the of the Trump um, the Trump Obama supporter. Go ahead, Sue. Oops, Sue, you're back on mute. I went to unmute. Okay, there we go. There you go. You're, so on, you're I, off mute. I think this relates to some of what Jackie was just saying. Um, I was doing the national survey with a voter. Uh, just a couple of days ago, who was a Bernie supporter, um, got pissed off at the Democratic Party, became a Trump supporter, and sees both of them as anti-party or anti-establishment party. He still feels that way, uh, even as Trump's been president. So I think it relates a little bit to what you were talking about, the Obama voters that went to Trump, but, but uh, it's kind of a, I don't know what my question is in this, but maybe you could speak to that. Well, I was going to uh, make a comment, too, is that, um, you know, it's, it's also a real fairness issue about how the, how the Republican Democrat Party is actually approaching independence. Um, you know, it, it, if you look at the majority of states, you know, independents can't participate in primaries <laughs> um, and they have an ability to even have their voice heard. Um, it was, it, what, what struck me is that right after the uh, 2016 election, when, when Trump was elected, literally days after the election, we, Jackie Sellett and I were on a panel, um, and, and, and part of the issue came up on, on open primaries, and, and more or less this, this, this appealing to the fairness issue about independence participating, if you have such a large block of individuals, and how they participate in the political process. And in this very, very hyper-partisan election, where Trump was just elected, it was amazing how the Republican and Democratic parties were totally aligned about any, any attempt to open primaries, to allow independents to participate. And it was almost, it was, almost, it was very surreal um, that, you know, it was just like, no, we're united on this issue. It's not a very divisive <laughs> election, but, you know, God forbid you let the independents actually have a voice. And I think further is that when independents may swing one way or the other, when the parties treat them, okay, now you're a Republican or now you're a Democrat is a fatal flaw. They're not. They're independents who, who perhaps agree or were anti the other party, but they don't automatically become Republicans and Democrats. And, and I think that's a fundamental shift that the parties have to look at of expanding their base 
And if you have a larger base, particularly look at young people today, that next, uh, uh, millennials, they're increasingly not joining parties. Um, and so how do you reach that, uh, uh, that population? You know, when we uh, worked on the chapter, we had a chance to interview uh, former Senate Majority Leader uh, Harry Reid, and he made that very point of just, you know, he really respected the whole idea of this two-party system or, or, or governing system, but was, was very, very concerned about where the directions happen, particularly with young people who do not want to be part of a party. Got it. Thank you. A um, couple more questions here. One of the things that you, one of the conceptions that you lay out in your book is, is, is looking at independence as humanist libertarians or progressive libertarians. And I had a question about that from uh, Joseph Colomer in Washington, D.C. Joseph, you're on. Joseph, you got to take uh, you got to take your phone off mute. Joseph, you still there? There he is. Okay, go ahead. You're on. Hi, hey. Uh, yeah, no, I, I was not persuaded that the independents are a block or a movement because what you show is that there are high diversity of values. You said there are common values, but actually the same person votes for Obama and for Trump. So what's the values? Uh, and so I think that I see it, just briefly, I see it more in your words as a breakdown of the traditional two-party system rather than a propellant of a new restructuring. I think we need the, the independence, of course, for political reform. Form, but we also need, I would say, say Schwarzenegger or the Democratic Party in Chicago, the governor of Nevada, etc., who are not independents. So I don't think the independence is a real movement. Maybe many independents in favor of political reform, but is even that with different proposals. Good point. And any thoughts on that? I mean, I would say that um, I, I appreciate uh, what the gentleman is saying here. I think that, um, I think the question, a couple of things, the question of whether values and ideology are the same thing um, is, I, I don't consider that an open and shut case, <laughs> frankly. Uh -huh. uh, and I think that, um, at least in my experience, uh, as someone who's been involved in organizing independence in many, many different kinds of situations around the country for 35 years, I've seen over and over again a tremendous sense of, um, of humanistic vision and values from people who um, perhaps the, the official arbiters of, uh, of enlightenment wouldn't necessarily <laughs> let into their club. Um, and uh, uh, so I've seen that really across the board. Uh, and so they, many of them wouldn't pass an ideological test if they were, if they had to take one, um, which they shouldn't. Uh, but they, they're people who care deeply about this country, about their families, about their fellow Americans, about problems of poverty and racial polarization and um, and, and immigration policy and, and, and such. And, you know, we, we could talk about all of that in more detail. Uh, but I think that maybe one way that I think about it, and the caller's question actually reminded me, I've been thinking the other day about the, the slogan, the phrase um, that actually, you know, was coined by Woodrow Wilson, <laughs> going back, you know, more than 100 years, making the world safe for democracy. Um, I think that the challenge we face right now is making democracy safe for the world. I think we have a whole set of things that we need to do to retool our democratic process to make it more coherent with the actual state of the electorate and also to create uh, a system that allows for the expression of humanistic values as opposed to polarization and um, and, and division. Just, no, just, just perhaps to clarify a little more, there are a couple of questions that may help perhaps 
from other people. One is saying, one asks about what's the difference between independents and non-affiliated, and the other is how, what's the proportion of independents that don't, don't vote, that they abstain. They would, perhaps they, this would help to profile the independents that fit your idea of values, etc. Yeah, I, I, th I think you bring up a, a couple of good points, just on the latter point, too, about how many participate or don't, because that's been written a lot, too, about that, you know, are independents not as, uh, as politically involved as, uh, as mm -hmm. the different parties? But in order to get at that question, you also have to look at what barriers um, independents have to participate in political process. I mean, you know, if, if in the majority of states, you can't participate in primaries and then you criticize them for not participating or statistically it looks like they don't participate. Um, so part of that question is that, you know, how do we as a system uh, allow for political participation, whether you're Republican or Democrat or independent? I think the other issue you're bringing up about what are the values or do they have distinct values? is something that I've really kind of struggled with. In fact, kind of looking at, you know, thematic issues, what is an independent? and trying to wrap your arms around a group of individuals that do not, in some respects, have not much in common, um, but what were some of the thematic issues that perhaps bind those together? Was it issues about fairness and participation? Was it issue about just wanting to be a change agent? Was it a, a kind of disdain for a hyper-partisan two-party you know, two system? Um, was it a concern is that once they voted for one party or another, what they felt was a lack of transparency or uh, the hyper politics that, that or hyper partisan that, that goes into governance. Um, it's kind of you when know, we look at having the president, the Senate, and Congress all in one party. Um, I, I, for one, find that always dangerous <laughs> because you have group think and, and, and so having that divided amount. So. So I think you bring up good points, and that's kind of what, from, from a research standpoint, what, is, what are the common link between this very disparate group of individuals? Um, but as far as the participation mm -hmm. piece, you know, research-wise, trying looking at those states that allow a more participatory involvement, particularly of independents, and, and looking at it from that perspective, I think would help answer that question. We have um, two questions about primaries, uh, and then after that, I want to I want to bring in Mike Kennick, who's on the board of the National Association of Nonpartisan Reporters. Um, but I have a, 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 a written submitted question uh, from uh, Norma Van Dyke in Pennsylvania. She asks, "Has any state made progress in opening up their primaries without first having a voter referendum, in which the question was put on the ballot?" Pennsylvania does not have voter referendum we can't put measures on the ballot to be voted on. Is there a way to correct this? Could we sue? And then Harry Kresge has a question about the New York primary, uh, which was just canceled yesterday. Uh, so Harry, go ahead and ask your question. Wait. Wait. Harry, are you there? Yeah, I think I'm there. You're I, there, we can hear you. Good. Uh, Actually, Jackie Saylor and I were just discussing this this morning, and uh, the uh, New York State Democratic Party canceled its presidential primary, uh, which uh, disappointed many independents as well as supporters of Bernie Sanders. And of course, many of those independents, some of them at least, specifically registered into the Democratic Party in order to vote in the primary. And uh, we explored I'd be eager to hear what others think, whether or not uh, a voter who finds himself or herself in that position has standing to sue legally, or once you join the Democratic Party, then you're stuck with what the party decides to do. And w what does that situation say about the balance of power between the voters and the parties? Just to add to what you were saying, Harry, what's interesting about New York is those independents you're talking about who had to join the party in order to vote in the primary, they had to do it months and months and months ago. So it's not something, and they have to stay in the party for many, many months. Um, just well, to add to what you're saying. I think they dropped it from a year to 30 days, unless I'm mistaken. But nonetheless, uh, they were disappointed. Right. 
No. John, did you want us to, to comment? Oh yeah, on? I'm sorry. Yes, I wanted, I was just, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, okay. Tom and Jackie, take it away. <laughs> um, well, uh, on Norma's point, uh, coming from the Pennsylvania experience, uh, yeah, it's a very uh, it's a very painful um, and restrictive situation um, to be in a state where there are closed primaries and no right to initiative and referendum because basically it means that the citizens can't take any action on their own behalf. Uh, it's got to come through the legislature, and given that the legislature is controlled by Democrats and Republicans, you know, unless and until they decide that it's going to be in their more narrow political interest to do something, uh, they won't. Uh, as a whole, though there are individual members of the Pennsylvania legislature who have uh, proffered the, the open primary reform through um, the legislative process. You know, in um, last year, independent voting ran a very, very aggressive campaign called Eyes on 2020 uh, to uh, bring public pressure to bear on the parties themselves uh, who do have the authority, they can act and open their own primaries to allow independent voters uh, to participate. We were focusing on that process relative to the upcoming presidential uh, election during the course of 2019 and uh, had, you know, battles state by state, uh, situation by situation and so forth. Uh, also calling on the National Party to take action, which they could have done but didn't. Um, so this is, in a way, here's where you start to see the power, it, it, it's such a conflictual situation because on the one hand you have this huge vast portion of the American public, 45%, who consider themselves to be independents, uh, which includes non-affiliated, to go to the prior question, includes non-affiliated people. Um, and so, you know, it's like you, you look at this, you talk with these people and you just look at the fact of this and you think it's like the equivalent of if you go to the, the, the Hoover Dam and you look at the incredible uh, hydroelectric power that exists in this water that's rushing through the dam, um, which generates electricity for millions and millions of homes and businesses and and enterprises and all of that. And you look at the independent voter community and you say, this is a huge power source, which is untapped and un unorganized, but which can play such a critical role in the democratization and, and the cultural and political development of the country. And, and yet there's so many barriers to it being harnessed. And that's that's really where we are right now. We're kind of caught in that conundrum. And I, and I think that, I know, I think Tom feels this way too. I think part of why we really wanted to write this chapter in the, in the book, Democracy Unchained, um, was just to bring forth this. It's almost like we wanted to publish a photograph, but you can't really photograph, right. you know, of this, this vast community of Americans who are saying, Hey, there's something wrong with our system, and, and we've got to we've got to retool it. We've got to reimagine it. We've got to reconstruct it. And I think for us, um, you know, you can't you can't change the world through the stroke of a pen, but you can educate and inform people and bring this question into the mainstream mm -hmm. of dialogue on on tactics for unchaining our democracy, as the title of the book suggests. And uh, so, but it, it's, it's very poignant actually, because you can see the potential, it's right there. It's right there on the horizon. And yet there's so many restrictions and barriers that prevent that from happening. Mm. Well stated. I wanna take it back uh, to an earlier part of our conversation about the, the different um, directions being advocated in response to the rise of independence, more party control or less party control. And I want to open it up to Mike Kennick, who has a great quote from a book written by Lee Drutman. Mike, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me okay? Yep, you're, you're on. Hey, everybody, Mike Kennick. Um, the, the quote I shared, it's in the chat. Most of you have probably seen it. But, um, you know, I think Lee's book, Lee Drutman's book is, is a little at least for me, it, it was a little bit of a, 
misnomer with the he the name of the book is breaking the two-party doom loop and um you know uh the case for multi-party democracy in america and you know as as someone who like many many on the call who are active in this uh, electoral reform space there was the there's the discussion about um okay as jackie just said the system's broken and the question is okay what do we do about it and a lot of people even myself included um you know believed um charlie Whelan and others you know creating a centrist party or creating a third party um or you know additional parties is it was the answer and and frankly you know i was skeptical going into reading lee's book because i i was again skeptical that the um the idea that more parties was the answer um and it wasn't really until i i was fully immersed in reading and understanding where where lee was coming from and i think it gets lost at least for me it, it took me a while to get it out of the book now that i've seen it it's very obvious to me what he's he's not arguing that creating multiple parties at least the way i read it he's not arguing that multiple parties is the solution he's arguing as I said in the quote above, with the premise that there is a role for parties, you know, basically that that's a way for citizens to feel, you know, engaged and, and connected to their to their government. You know, he says bad things happen to democracies when large numbers of citizens feel alienated and unrepresented. Parties are the essential institutions connecting citizens with governing. And then he says when citizens disconnect from parties, this is fertile ground for anti-system demagogues, um, you know, to do what I think we've seen, seen happen. And so it got me to at least pause and say, okay, there's a role for parties and it's a way for citizens to engage. But again, rather than making the way I read it, the argument that creating multiple parties was the answer, what he was re really saying was, you know, creating a better system, which heavily is based on proportional representation. Um, and, he, and again, he gives models of some examples like Germany and others, Australia, around the world and New Zealand, where they have proven uh, systems based on proportional representation. But he's basically saying that if you change the system and you do the right set of reforms, ranked choice voting and other reforms, the result will be multiple parties. And that's just a, it at least changed my whole perception. And, and, and again, the way the book title read, you know, I think again, leads you down a different path. So I'm really just curious, you know, what, what the panelists think about that line of thinking that Lee puts out there. Well, yeah, I, I think there's, I think it's a very interesting perspective. And, um, you know, it was interesting that uh, on the Morrison study, we asked independents, there is a, a group of those that are part of the independents who, who don't, who are anti-party, period. <laughs> and even if you created multiple parties, wouldn't be part of a party and because they just don't like parties. And, um, but I think, I, I think the, the, the point that really resonates is that, you know, how do we make a system fair where, where every individual can participate? And we look at our political structures and states um, that really prevent a large portion of individuals from participating is, is very problematic. And it may very well be as, as, you, as you look at reforms, whether it's nonpartisan redistricting, same day registration, um, um, participation in, in primaries, that all these may result to, to, to more parties or more choices. But I think the fundamental issue is, um, you know, how can a system, a political system, operate that disenfranchises right. such a large portion of individuals? Got it. Um, we have time for one more question, and I'm going to go to Ann Gipalo in Florida, who has two questions. So we're going to get a two for one to wrap us up here. Ann, go ahead. You there, you there, Ann?
All right. Right. Yes. Ah, you're on. Go ahead. Hey, thanks. Yes, uh, my question was about um, serious non-election um, related polling of independents. Where do they stand on specific issues, the um, environment, um, election financing reform, um, health care, education, et cetera, so that we can appeal to them as issue voters. I'm part of the indivisible group here in my um, county, and we put on our webpage platform that basically we're open to anybody who cares about specific progressive issues. Now, I don't, I don't know if necessarily a Republican who is passionate about the environment would feel uncomfortable in our group because those are the things we ask our candidates about and we have um, candidate forums for city elections. So if you talk to people about an issue, maybe we could attract some of them and maybe even some of the Republicans who say that they're for gun reform, et cetera. I mean, you, you have to move where people are going to make a change on the things you care about or nothing's gonna get done. We're gonna be constantly just battling and the parties are gonna move to the extremes and no one's gonna be happy. Thank you. Sure, Tom, Jackie, you have thoughts about that? I mean, a, I, a couple of thoughts on the, on the question of um, looking for sort of a gauge on uh, independence positions on issues. Uh, you know, as as the caller, uh, the speaker was defining them. I mean, we write a little bit about this uh, in uh, our chapter. This is where we, um, our conclusion was to describe uh, independence as a whole, as kind of adhering to a philosophy of uh, humanist libertarianism. But for example, 66% um, of independence feel that the economic system in our country is unfair and that uh, this is basically a comment about um, income inequality. 66% felt that that's a very serious problem that the country is facing. 66% uh, of independents believe that immigrants and having a strong uh, immigration, a pro-immigration policy in the country is a positive thing uh, to have. Uh, I could go on on issues of the environment and education and, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so from the vantage point of looking to build coalitions around issues, um, I think you know if you're a progressive and if you're looking to build issue-oriented coalitions around traditional progressive issues, you will find a lot of resonance for those issues among uh, independent voters, not everyone, but but some. But I think perhaps, and maybe I can suggest that um, I think part of what independents are are perhaps uh, suggesting by virtue of who they are and the choice that they've made is that the system itself actually precludes these kinds of more fluid issue-oriented coalitions because people are being constantly shoved back into institutional divisions uh, and divides. And a very, very big issue uh, for independence is the whole question of voter mobility, of wanting to be able to move around and about the political spectrum choice of candidates, issue coalitions, and so on and so forth without getting locked into either a political party or an ideological category of some kind. And I think this is very important because look, we're, we're living through a, a pandemic in which multiple, multiple aspects and facets of the way we live and the way we do our lives uh, is, uh, has been changed and and we're as we come out of that and as the country quote unquote reopens there's a whole set of questions that need to get reopened about how we do certain kinds of things and I'm hoping and I'm seeing this in in the surveys that we're doing 
now uh, at independent voting, the most current of which shows that 77% of independents believe that this coronavirus crisis has revealed the depth and the extent to which partisanship has made our political system uh, unviable and unable to respond to actual circumstances that people are facing in their daily lives. So I think we have to look perhaps more there on the systemic side than just simply on the issue side. Uh, but I think overall, we're in a very fluid situation and I'm hoping that part of what can come out of it is a more fluid approach to the way the system operates. Well, thank you, um, Tom. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, those are great words to end on. Uh, more fluidity would certainly be welcome, um, I think, by the vast majority of Americans uh, and especially independents. Um, I want to really encourage everyone not just to buy a copy of Democracy Unchained and read the whole book and this chapter in particular, but share it with friends and family. Uh, it's an important book and an important conversation. And there's a lot of books coming out now about democracy reform, changing the system, changing the culture, and this is a very important one. Uh, so please go out and get it. It's, it's hard copy paperback and Kindle. Um, Thank you again. We're going to, uh, we have Zoom calls coming up next Wednesday. Uh, we're going to look at uh, legal and civil rights controversies. And in two weeks, we're talking with two California professors, Charles Munger and Christian Gross, who are going to talk about the research they've done um, on the impact of top two open primaries in California from a voter satisfaction and a policy point of view. It's going to be a great discussion. So I would encourage everyone to come on those and invite invite friends to, to participate as well. Uh, so thank you all uh, for participating and we'll see you soon. Thanks, John, for having us. Yeah, thanks, thanks John. Thanks very Take much. Care.